Welcome to the fourth watch of the night. If you had a band like that playing during the fourth watch of the night, everybody would kind of be upset because that's the time of the night when people sleep the deepest, which is why we're trying to uh, reach out to you sleepers and say, oh, wake, awake, you who sleep. Anyway, my name is Greg Fisher. I'm one half of the fourth watch of the night. Really glad you're here with us. I'm telling you, we value our listeners, we value you guys, and we value the comments that we get back as well. Yes, we and, do. Uh, one half of the other half, uh, well, no, just the complete other half of the fourth <laughs> watch of the night is uh, Linda Morris. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. And um you know, speaking of the fourth watch of the night, I think there's a lot of people that were surprised they were kind of staying up and, you know, they thought that fourth watch, uh, we'd be seeing Jesus come because of the eclipse. <laughs> Although it was a solar eclipse, so he wouldn't come during the fourth watch. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was an afternoon eclipse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, for some people, that is the fourth watch. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, as I was watching some of the some of the ridiculousness that happens in Christianity <laughs> when people hold themselves out as prophets and stuff, and talking about this eclipse, and I'm thinking, this is something that happens about eighteen to twenty times a year, right? So, well, somewhere, well, and we, yeah. You know, the it doesn't always one, happen over the heartland of America. Yeah. Well, the solar eclipse is a little bit more rare than that. And the bottom line we have to remember with prophecy is everything is relative to where? To Israel, not the United States. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, the word of the month here uh, on the uh, fourth watch is uh, authenticity. Mm -hmm. and uh, the need for authentic Christianity. And we've been, along the way of being authentic Christians, we've been diving uh, deep into a topic that is making uh, uh, waves uh, everywhere, and that's leadership abuse and uh, uh, church uh, leadership abuse and uh, church leaders and relationships and all of those, all of that. And uh, man, um, the responses coming back have been pretty big. Um, this is this is obviously a huge, huge problem. Well, if you think about one of the what is one of the chief complaints about church, it's um, hypocrites. Yeah. What is a hypocrite? Um, in Jesus' time, a hypocrite was an actor. And we know, um, I'm studying the books of wisdom right now in my class, and we know that the wisest people in the world, um, Solomon and and King David, they, they blew it a lot. And what we know is it's not the fact that you fall. It's what you do after the fall that counts. Yeah. Do you get back up? Do you repent? Yeah. Do you go on? Yeah. yeah. And people learn more. We learn more from those falls than ever from someone who presents this perfect little Christian persona that never does anything wrong. Because how do you live up to that? Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. Hey, I've got a video clip of a guy presenting something pretty authentic here. We can wait, watch it for just a minute. 
Why is it that if one ninja hurts you at church, you blame the whole church? I've never heard of school hurt. I've never heard of mall hurt. Praise the Lord. I never heard of ball game hurt. Never heard of hospital hurt. Now tell me, haven't you got hurt in those places? You don't blame the whole hospital. You don't blame the whole restaurant. I don't believe in any preachers. Because one preacher disappointed me. Did you quit doctors? Have you quit, quit dentists? Have you, have you given up on all? <laughs> <laughs> that well, is, uh, that's one way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, he's saying the truth. Right. He's saying the truth. A lot of people out there have been hurt by church and just that becomes now the excuse for not, not continuing on. But as you were pointing out in the wisdom literature, it's not, a, it's not about falling. It's about getting up after you fell. Well, we experienced some ball game hurt recently at a baseball game. <laughs> I think I think the team experienced it worse than we did. So what do you do? Do you quit playing or do you jump back in the game? Mm -hmm. You come out swinging, right? So one of the things that um, I have an unusual way of looking at life. Uh, Greg and I don't always agree on my visualizations. <laughs> so I'll, I'll take the blame for this one. So you all have heard of the dating game. Oh yeah. And so the church is visualized as the bride of Christ. Well, picture if this was a worldly bride, you have this time on earth and it's like the dating game. And what do we do when we date? We're trying to put on this persona. We're trying, I mean, people actually out and out lie about who they are and what they believe. Yeah, they present themselves as something totally and someone totally different from who they are. So when we're going through our time here on earth, we're trying to find out which church, which pastor, which community reflects scripture, reflects our own values, because some of them have a little bit different emphasis that's not necessarily right or wrong. And then there's others that are just way out there. We've been talking about the cults. So yeah. Yeah. Um, we know the way out there thing. But what we have to remember is, like these people in the dating game, we can't fool Jesus. The false prophets can't fool Jesus. And these false churches, these cults cannot fool Jesus. Well, but not only that, it's not just the false prophets and false cults and that. Uh, the glitzy glamour uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the big evangelical churches, not fooling Jesus either. No. And, uh, and, and you know, people who, who are being drawn by that glitz and glamour uh, are, the, are, are fruit, so to speak, of the ministry that's going to disappear the moment there is persecution or question about their faith. You put on a bunch of glitz and glamour and you go through a storm and it's all going to wash away. Yeah. But yeah. we need a faith that is the solid rock that isn't going to wash away. And as one of the parties in this dating game, if you will, it's our responsibility to seek that authenticity and to be authentic if you read Psalms and Proverbs, especially Psalms, David just, he puts it all out there. Oh, he yeah. pours out his heart. And we need, we need to be no less because God says, this is a man after my own heart. You know, uh, David, uh, you know, we probably, we probably wouldn't allow him to teach Sunday school <laughs> at our church. No. Uh, I, I mean, he's a polygamist. He, he killed a guy to get his wife, killed two guys to get wives. Um, I mean, he's, he's just a guy that, that, that we would be saying, uh, uh, brother David, we, you, you know, uh, you're going to have to come to men's group for a while and get straightened out. 
but uh, but God says, this is a man after my own heart. And and he will do all the things that I'm asking of him. Mm-hmm. And uh, wow, um, that's a that's a huge thing. The the other big thing about David is he believes God. Right. He believes God and trusts him. And uh, and that comes through in the Psalms. And when he's flat on his face before God, he gives us someone real that we can identify with. Oh yeah. I mean, there's some authenticity there. And and he yeah, and he doesn't pull any punches at all. No, no. Not so- not in the not in those Psalms where he's crying out for justice. And uh, crying out that his enemies are going to be, you know, put to shame. Uh, he de- he describes some things in there that that would not be acceptable on YouTube, uh, but um, but he lays it all out there before God. And when he says, "Hey, my reproach is before me. Create in me a clean heart. Yes. Renew a right spirit." Yes, those are things that. Um, when we read that, I, every time I read that, I that becomes my prayer. So I read that a lot. <laughs> so, Amen. So Amen. we had talked about Galatians 5 last week. You were going to bring that up in a different version. Yeah, I, I've got on the screen here uh, the message uh, 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 translation. It's actually a paraphrase uh, of the New Testament, but it's... Uh, it's the New Testament in in contemporary language, mm-hmm. and I I just loved how um, uh, Peterson, who is the who is the uh, translator and writer, um, mm-hmm. uh, lays this out, and he 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 does it in such a great contemporary way. But he says it is obvious the kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Mm -hmm. And then he gives us a list. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. Mm -hmm. Man, when you think about the pastors that, that have fallen, when you think about the, when you think about religious uh, leaders and Sunday school teachers and youth pastors that have, uh, been engaged in sexual abuse of minors. That's what it's talking about. And that comes out of trying to get your own way all the time. A stinking a, a accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, mm-hmm. trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition all-consuming yet never satisfied once, a brutal temper, uh, the impotence to live, to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives. Uh, Margaret made a comment uh, the other day. We were watching something and and little kids were getting uh, prizes and what, and I, being recognized and um, all of them had a different last name than their mothers, mm-hmm. except for one. And Margaret said, wow, that must not be a divided family there. Small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. I, I could go on. Um, and that's that, that dehumanization. That's one of the first things a cult does. You are part of the body, but you aren't an individual. Yeah. You give up everything for the community. Right. And um, wow. So Ooh. we know we were going to talk about the pleasure and self gratification that. Um, is evident in this. That's part of the fruit of their ministry, which Galatians tells us the self-gratification is not 
of God. Right. Right. And, and, and so, and so we're not called upon, we're not called as ministry people to, to, to do ministry for self gratification Mm -hmm. or self aggrandizement. Uh, we're called to do ministry, um, um, uh, because that's what he's calling us to do. Right. Uh, when, when in the 15th chapter, uh, no, yes, 15th chapter of, of uh, John's gospel, when Jesus is, um, did I say that right? I don't think that I did. When Jesus is talking to uh, Peter after the resurrection, and there, and he says to Peter, you know, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know, I love you. And there's that conversation. What isn't, what isn't apparent, but is in the background is Peter's understanding of what is going to be happening in the very near future. He has no idea. Right. He has no idea that Jesus is going to ascend into heaven, has no idea that the Holy Spirit is going to come, has no idea what it means to feed his sheep. And, and on top of that, there's this underground rivalry between Peter and John. And, and that's why Peter at the end says to Jesus, well, what will this man do? And he's pointing at John. Uh, he wants to know: Is John getting a leg up on me? And we and you see Jesus uh, uh, address that in Acts chapter one. But uh, we don't do ministry for self-aggrandizement. We do ministry because we're being obedient to the Master that called us. God doesn't give us an itinerary and a contract that says, "Okay." You're going to go here and you're going to preach. You're going to go here and you're going to do this. We trust him step by step, day by day. Sometimes with ministry, we experienced this when we had the ranch, is every month that I paid the bills, I'd go, wow, there was, a mo- there was enough this month. There was never an abundance, but there was always enough. And that was a miracle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and Margaret and I have Margaret and I have experienced that many many times. In fact, we're experiencing it right now, <laughs> and uh, yeah. But but take an exact for example uh, of what we're talking about in terms of satisfying desires to be at the front of the line all the time and to be the center of attention all the time. Look at how uh, these false cults. Uh, prey on unsuspecting people. Right. I they, mean, they prey on people's pride and their their self-indulgence. You deserve this. You you deserve to be among the elite and we are the elite. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the invitations. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could be a part of this family. Right. But they often they they are they are preying on on vulnerable people. Uh, they have a I, I the cults have like a built-in radar to find vulnerable people and prey on them, especially uh, vulnerable youth who are in, you know, like the first years of university or college or just out of high school. And they're still kind of forming and finding who they are. And there's oftentimes right at that point, um, uh, that cults uh, then uh, can 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 kind of suck you in um, uh, to be a part of the cult, and you're not thinking clearly, uh, but you get sucked in out of uh, frustration, loneliness, disappointment, fear, all of those things. Well, if you think, I'm going to go way back. You think about junior high. A junior high is one of the most clicky ages. I don't want to think about junior high. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's a rough age. Yeah. This this is a tough age for kids, is junior high. And so those who are outcasts, who don't belong, 
are especially vulnerable later for someone who comes in. If they don't have someone in their life grounding them, they're doubly vulnerable later for these people that come in and go, oh, we love you. We want you to belong. And they go, oh, I never had that before. I can't wait. And they don't yeah. know the cost. Yeah, that's that love bombing thing that cults do. They, mm -hmm. they, they, they come and they make this emotional connection with people. And then they keep, uh, you know, affirming them right. and using words like love and community. Uh, you're a part of the community. This is a community of love and and we're bonding together. But the goal is, is to get them to adopt uh, this new cult group as their primary fam family identity. Right. And so part of what they do is they try to sever attachment to their other family, their birth family. Yeah. Um, and any other relationships they have that are healthy because they've got to get people isolated so that they can continue indoctrinating. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times some of these false prophet guys uh, uh, learn everything they can about an individual and then they use it to control and manipulate them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and here, here's an example. Of course, I'm an old timer, so this is an example that goes back a ways. But, you know, years and years ago, there was a guy on the radio that had some kind of ministry that I never could really get to the bottom of what it was all about. And that his name was Jim Jones, and he was from the People's Temple. And he would have these big crusades. And he would call people out of the audience and and have them stand up and say, uh, you know, uh, in your house, uh, there's a picture of Jesus over your couch. Move it to the left two inches. There. I've healed you of cancer. They wouldn't even know they had cancer. You of know, course they didn't, because they probably didn't. <laughs> yeah. And 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 how did he get all that information? Well, when people came and they were being registered to have uh, prayer for the sick over them, they, they, the people registering them just got all that all that information and it would be conveyed to him electronically and he would call people out and uh, as several of the several of those televangelists during that same era got caught uh, using electronic devices to communicate stuff like that into their ear, and then uh, you know uh, they could that was that was just a part of the show. But you, you know what's hard with with that is that is also a method. Uh, maybe not the electronic surveillance, but that's also a method used by these fortune tellers and these prophets of evil, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Is that they find out just enough and then they'll fabricate on it. Yeah. And yeah. when good imitates or people who claim to be godly imitate evil, I have a problem with that. I do too. I do too. And, and, and that is a way of exposing that this is not God. Mm -hmm. um, wow. If and, you have to use that kind of manipulation, it's not from God. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that, the, that the cults are doing is that, is that, is that social isolation uh, because once you get into the community and they cut you off, uh, mm -hmm. then you get assigned a lot of times a mentor or a spiritual leader uh, that that is supposed to be helping you come into the fullness of all that the cult is teaching is available to you, but really is manipulating you, controlling you. And then eventually filtering your contacts with the outside world. 
No, one of the other things too we've seen with these, um, I'm going to say Christian cults. Let's just say the the ones that are probably a little bit over the edge is that um, you'll be when you're praying. They the name it and claim it. You claim it. You pray for it. God's got to give it to you. You know, he just wave that magic wand and, and there it is. But then if your prayer is not answered, they will tell you it is not my fault. I prayed for you. And so many people I've prayed for have been healed or become rich or whatever it is they're praying for. If this did not happen, it's because you lacked faith or because right. you are sinful. Right. Right. Always blame the victim. Right. And, and, and that's, that's, that's horrible. In fact, that's one of the big damages that, uh, that the uh, name it and claim it, the word of faith movement uh, does on people is leaving them, is leaving them damaged. I, I've seen things that are so horrific mm -hmm. that, that the people, you know, doing this stuff ought to be in prison, to be quite frank with you. Right. I mean, I, I remember uh, uh, in a town where I was serving as a pastor, there was a wonderful couple that were active in their church and, and just really great people. But, you know, uh, 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 there were the there was a, 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 a move of God of some kind. I don't know. I wasn't there, so I can't judge, but it resulted in, in a new ministry starting up that was going to train people, uh, to be, you know, Christian, uh, superstars in the word of faith. And, and this couple, the precious couple, the talented, uh, got a prophecy over their lives uh, that they would be um, uh, uh, nationally known um, uh, in 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 music and worship, leading worship. And so the guy was like the guy was like um, inheriting a business from his father, or like a it was like a third generation business and. He sold all of that and they they just waited because mm -hmm. any day now the call was going to come and they would be off and running and the call never came because that's not how you that's not how you develop a ministry. That's not how God works. And 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 I, I, I looked at them and I thought, God, what a waste. Mm -hmm. And 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 it. I mean, I was grieved deep in my heart. I wasn't in a position to speak pastorally into that situation. I was observing it from afar, but I thought, what destruction this has come into their lives. How will they recover? And we can't blame all the bad things that happen to us on evil or sin. Life happens. Sometimes God uses or will allow adversity to occur because that's a refining tool that a lot of times gives us more compassion for maybe a group we wouldn't have had compassion with. It gives us, it stands off some of the rough edges. Maybe it's, it's a training ground. I always call it the school of hard knocks. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. The school of hard knocks. And, um, it's just interesting. Um, this just this past week, I'm I'm walking through a tragedy with uh, with uh, um, a family that my that my daughter knows, and um, you know the questions are why did this happen? How could this happen? How could a loving God uh, allow uh, uh, this to happen in some way? And there aren't answers to that. And some of the answers are, it's a part of life. Mm -hmm. we, we make choices. We made decisions. We went in directions that may or may not have been good for us. 
but we also begin to uh, reap what we have sown. And and Paul makes that so clear in Galatians when he says, "God is be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you are going to reap." You look at, for example, Job, what he went through. Yeah. That was not because of his own sin or his own anything, really. It's, it, it, was, it was really, he, everything he went through was for all of us that would come through afterwards for a chance to learn. I mean, that's not the only reason he went through it. But God often uses the things that are the most devastating to create a new ministry to change our minds and our hearts towards something that we may have held false beliefs or false assumptions on. Amen. Uh, I, I, I agree with you about the, the refining tool aspect, the refining, um, uh, you know, that in when we're being refined by God, uh, the 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 impurities come to the top, and He is lovingly able uh, to, you know, scrape that off the slag, so that our life will uh, become that kind of pure uh, gold. Uh, that he's that that he that he wants to produce in us, and I, you know, as we're talking about as we're talking about um, uh, falsity rather than on authenticity, um, one of the things that happens in 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 false cults and especially in the Christian world uh, is when they. Uh, the church, a church, begins to claim uh, that they're they're the only true church, right? And I and I think that's the biggest red flag. Well, we've talked about prophets and apostles. So when you talk about prophets and apostles, there are true prophets and apostles. But if someone says, I'm the only one in the whole world that God has revealed this to, I'm the only one that God is speaking through, be very careful. That, I mean, that's a, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. Um, you know, it's, it's, you, you run into people that are, that are the founders of these, of a cult, or uh, you can also, I mean, I find them in, in pulpits from time to time. Um, God is revealing to me something new that was never revealed before, and this is coming only through me. Whoa, that's a, that is something that I, I've got to step back from. And one of the things that I'm afraid of, and this is, a, this is an alarm bell in my mind, is that now um, we have people publishing their own uh, peculiar translations of the scripture that have no background in biblical languages, have no background uh, in, in, in uh, theology or even, even thinking through some of the big thoughts, but, but coming through and producing a Bible of questionable value uh, where all the words get changed around and it begins to reflect what I think about uh, 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 things and what I think about uh, God, what I think about what God is doing, what I think about how it all works together. And, and once that is happening, we are losing the measuring rod Mm-hmm. That 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 keeps us fully oriented to the truth of God's word. Well, if you think about a blueprint, the Bible is our blueprint for living. Okay, 
if you make a copy of that on most copy machines, it's going to be 98%. You copy it again, it decreases by another 2% and so on and so on. So um, sometimes what we have to do is go back to the original blueprint, not create a whole new one, go back to the original, which is accurate and true. And, I, and, and that's what worries me. How will people find their way out of the fog of inauthentic uh, religious and spiritual teaching if they do not have a firm measuring rod that measures what is truth and what is error? You know, you can't uh, work with my dad. Uh, a, a lot when I was a teenager on, on doing building projects, you know, and you had to, he, he had to follow the plans. There had to be, he had to measure things had to be just exactly right. And, and there was no, there was no time when you just kind of say, Oh no, I feel like we could do it this way. Um, and just kind of free form it. It comes out as a mess. We had to follow a plan and we had to measure with tools. And that's one of the things that that we do as as uh, really as teachers and as pastors, we're using the word of God to measure. I, I measure my sermons by the word of God. Am I faithfully, faithfully, uh, presenting the Word of God, not my ideas, not my theology. I have a good theology, but I want to present the Word of God. We want faithfully. to make sure it's accurate. If you want to be creative, if you don't want to measure, you can do a painting. Yeah. Um, you can create your own picture. You can, you know, grab a paintbrush and paint. You can create your own little world in that. But if you're going to build a foundation of substance, even being off by a quarter inch can put you off inches by the time you get to the roof line. Oh, yeah. I have wallpapered houses that I went, whoa, <laughs> how did those here? walls get so crooked? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've so, lived in houses like that. Yeah, or the floor, you know. I, I, <laughs> One time I told Mike, I said, watch this. I put a marble on the floor and it goes. Shh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We lived in a house like that. If you spilled something in the kitchen, it was in the living room carpet before you could get something out to, to clean it up. I mean, yeah, the floor was that bad. And and that's, you know, that's where uh, the floor has not been made to adhere to a rigorous standard. And we have a rigorous standard in the word of God. And um, wow. And here's the thing. Sometimes we say things that are offensive. Um, as Christians on our podcast, okay, maybe I do, maybe you don't. But <laughs> so the thing is, our goal is to always speak truth. And truth is not always comfortable. There have been times that people spoke truth to me and it really hurt because it was true. And yes. I, was, I was looking for somebody to tell me, oh, it's okay. That's all good. You don't have to change anything. And instead what I got was, you really need to look into this. Yes. 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 Think about this a little bit. Yeah. You, <laughs> might, you might want to rethink that. Kind of like when we discussed if we actually talk about the dating game on here. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, uh, and, 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 and Paul makes it so clear in, in second, in second Timothy in chapter three, he says, uh, you speaking of Timothy, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. 
-hmm. my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Mm-hmm. And and he goes on then to say, you got to be founded in the word of God. And Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. Mm, yeah. So that in the in this fourth watch of the night, we are calling people back to a firm foundation, which is the word of God, the scripture, and the scripture that ha- is breathed out by God is profitable. Oh my. So one of the things these cults do is they have no regard for church history. Mm-hmm. No, not all church history is good. Nope. I would say that probably the Crusades were not really, I, no doubt about it. The Crusades were bad. There's, there's church history that's bad. But yeah. the point is you look at that and you learn from it. And you realign yourself with the original scripture, the original word, the original, what Jesus said to do. Yeah. You know, I I was just talking with somebody the other day and, 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 and we were talking about the reformation Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, Protestantism, is a result of the Reformation. Uh, Luther and Calvin, Zwingli, and others were trying to to uh, reform the church, not create a new church. And um, and and the comment was made that before the Reformation, there just wasn't any um, anything um, uh, that would have been like biblical Christianity for a long time. And I thought to myself, mm, well, actually, there have been groups mm-hmm. and uh, how biblical and and how much they would be like us and how much they would fit into a denom- denomination today. There have been groups of people who did cry out for authenticity, that did try to follow the scriptures. And, 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 uh, and, you know, my mind went immediately to Jan Hus and the Moravians. And he, um, because of, of, of challenging uh, the traditions of the, of the Roman Catholic Church and also attempting to put uh, the word of God into the local language, uh, was burned in a, in a, in a huge bonfire. Uh, just outside the cathedral. Now, that's a point that we need to talk about. For a long time, they only wanted Bibles that the religious leaders could read because Mm -hmm. leaders wanted to do all the interpretation. Red flag. The other thing, too, that um, as you're speaking of this, I'm thinking is we're talking about church history. And the question needs to be addressed. Do churches need to repent? Did I say that in my outside voice? (laughs) (laughs) Is that something we can finish in 10 minutes? (laughs) Is that something we should even be talking about? Uh, Yes, we should. Because you think about David creating me a clean clean heart, O Lord, renew a right spirit in me. How much more so do we need that in our churches where a church repents? A lot of times churches mishandle discipline. And I've seen churches held 
down. They never grew after mm-hmm. they did that. Mm-hmm. Well, unpack that a little bit. What do you mean by mishandled discipline in the church? Sometimes rather than dealing with the core issue, everything is blanketed. As in fact, I've seen where older men were taking advantage of younger women and they were both disciplined equally. I, there's a big difference in maturity level there. Uh, how, how young were these young women? Uh, under 18. Yeah. That, see, and that's there's and, another big issue right there. And that is that uh, a pastor of a church uh, is a mandate, at least here in the state of Oklahoma. I don't know about any other state, but I know in the state of Oklahoma, pastor is a mandated reporter. And some very big churches in Tulsa have have had very bad experiences because um, they had uh, those things happen and they and it was like, well, we just handled this in house and and and, uh, you know, we disciplined this person. Sorry, that's not good enough. You're a mandated reporter and you must mandate sexual abuse of you must report sexual abuse of minors. You don't have a choice. There's not an option. And one of the reasons for that <laughs> Is because they can go to another church or another organization and do the same thing. Once they get on a list, yeah, then they're monitored. Yeah, yeah. A good church. If your church is not doing this, by the way, <coughs> you you need to be aware that this is a danger point. But uh, a, a a a a good church uh, is doing background checks. Mm-hmm. <coughs> of people who are working in the congregation, not, not just with children, just with people working in the congregation. They're doing background checks. Um, and um, I, that's, that's scary uh, to me. Um, thinking about, you know, you have to get a background check on all your Sunday school teachers but uh, this is the world that this is the world that we're living in. Um, I walked into church on Sunday morning and uh, greeted at the door by uh, uh, armed uh, security uh, people. Uh, there are uh, in our church. Um, there are um, uh, police officers and detectives that come. And they are also armed, and uh, we have visible uniform police mm-hmm. uh, that are around. And uh, you know, it, 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 the, my ten-year-old self, if I was going back in time to say this is what the future looks like, would not be able to in any way understand that. Mm-hmm. So. Let's go a little bit deeper because you've kind of very nicely moved away from do churches need to repent. Mm. <laughs> and and let me go on record as saying yes, we do. Right. I and the crusades, that's something that as Christians we were wrong. And we need to look at those times that we were wrong. A lot of the segregation. If you look at, there's so many things when the church should have been leading the way for social justice, and we did it. And by that, cultural, very definitely. We need to be embracing other cultures. And there's times, the things that have happened, the church was was like a cult before the Reformation. Well, it certainly wasn't faithful to the word of God, that's for Mm -hmm. sure. And uh, the absolute control 
that came um, uh, that the church had. And that was because they could also control who received the sacraments, which is the means of grace. Right. Um, uh, yes, that created abuse. That that created huge, huge cavernous uh, 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 kinds of, of of opportunities for abuse and and um, and for and for self uh, uh, aggrandizement, a uh, self promotion. Yeah. There was a, we had a hiker come through one time and he was talking about um, one of the trails that he hiked in Europe. It's a, a big spiritual journey. And he said, they charged for this, they charged for this, they charged for this. And I know the churches used to do that every, they charged for everything. It was a business. It wasn't a ministry. And this man looked around the ranch that we did, which was a business. And he said, this feels more like ministry than what I experienced there. Yeah. 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 That's because I think of what was in you guys' heart as you, as you managed that ranch and, and went, went so far out of your way uh, to really, uh, make a difference in people's lives. And sometimes the church has gotten um, you know we we become so focused on the organization and the building and the facilities being the church. And all of that stuff has overhead that has to be paid. so you're looking for various ways uh, to get funding. And it's uh, it's a slippery slope uh, that you're on because pretty soon um, uh, you you have uh, someone out uh, selling indulgences uh, so you can get away with sin anytime you want by paying a fee that will automatically get all of that taken care of. One of the things with the the business that w was really a crossover into ministry is you do what is right regardless of the cost. Yes, yes, yes. If it, uh, if it costs us, if we have to pay it out of our personal pocket, yeah. you do what is right. You do what is right and you stand by your word. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things, like I said, with, with church, do they need to repent? I feel that our American church has fallen away so drastically. And we do need to repent corporately and personally. Well, the corporate, the corporate repenting isn't going to come until there's personal repenting that goes on within the leadership. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I've, I've seen, and I am seeing organizations that are struggling, uh, with, um, sins of the past and struggling with how do we, how do we repent and make amends for this? Mm -hmm. And in the struggle, it's, it is very difficult. It's, uh, it is uh, almost like we're going to lose, but at the end, uh, we don't lose. We actually gain. And that what we gain is that thing that we started with. And that's authenticity. Just thinking when, when we, at the very beginning, we spoke about how, People learn more from what we do when we acknowledge our failure and we face it than they do from when we cover up and pretend everything's well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, when I was a pastor and, and um, you know, sometimes the church elders kind of uh, – 
uh, take you to task on a mistake that you made and it's, and it's a legitimate mistake, you know, Mm -hmm. and I just put up my hands and say, okay, I'm born again. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm coming to the altar. Right. And and that isn't going to have, that's not going to be a part of my ministry again. And, um, and there's other times when you're being falsely accused, but, but too many times it was really genuinely uh, a need for them to call us, call me back into account. Do you remember the old days? I'm dating myself here, <laughs> where you would go to church and then people would come up and just pray at the altar. Oh, yes. Not necessarily with someone. Sometimes it was. But it was a chance to get on your knees in church in front of God. And it's not like it's necessarily any more sacred than doing it in your closet, but it's more public. And people can see that, yes, this person is on their knees repenting, even if they don't know why they're repenting. Or, or even if they are repenting, maybe they're working out something else. Right. Um, Interestingly enough, um, in, in our church, uh, which is a Presbyterian church, um, they, they do uh, almost every Sunday say, uh, if you have a need or you need to talk to the Lord or whatever, come here to the front. We have places for you to kneel and, and take some time. Uh, to to talk with the Lord. If you need prayer, there are people here that can pray with you. Mm-hmm. And um, But I remember that used to be um, a part of, uh, of uh, worship, and especially uh, back in the days when we had Sunday night services. Uh, you always, the pastor would give an opportunity for you to, to take time in prayer and, and work some stuff out. It was a great way to transition, to segue into uh, the work week coming up. And so, okay, we're almost out of time here. But as we hold up and reflect on what a cult is, and as we look at the Christian church in the past, we need to be sure that we're not guilty of the same thing. When you take the address the log in the eye of these cults, we also need to make sure that we as a church are being true to God's word. Amen. And I think that that's I think I think that that's what we've in a way tried to do right here on our podcast is, um, you know, uh, we got quite a bit of of blowback because we gave the the Jehovah's Witnesses a black eye. Well, a little uh, bit. We're yeah, and uh, we're looking at uh, you know we're looking at the 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 evangelical Christian Church, uh, and and looking uh, with the same kind of uh, with the same kind of eye of uh, is this real? Is it authentic? Does mm-hmm. it reflect the Word of God? And if it doesn't, it needs to be called out. And it needs to be changed. Amen. Wow. We are coming right up to the end, aren't we? We are. And um, can we pray for our churches? Yeah, let's do that. Just a little short prayer. Lord Jesus, I pray right now. There are there are pastors all over America that are that are working so hard and and their commitment is to authentic Christianity to an authentic expression of Christianity and i pray lord that tonight you would hear their prayer strengthen their hearts give them peace this is a Sunday evening. They, they may have had a very difficult day today. But I pray, Lord, that you would give them peace and rest. Confirm to them the calling that you have on their lives. And Lord, there are churches 
across our land that are departing from the faith. And I pray, Lord, that you would use ministries like ours to call people back, to call them back to the strong foundation of the Word of God, that unshakable foundation, Lord. And Lord, there are cults that are that are uh, 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 picking off the weaker ones in the flock. I pray, Lord, that you would send shepherds to to protect them, uh, elders, Lord, to to help the weak uh, understand, help the weak to become strong and protect them from the wolves that are coming around, seeking them as prey. Lord, I pray that as uh, we encounter sin, we will be humble enough to ask your forgiveness and to repent from it. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining us, and God bless you this week. God bless you, and we will see you next week at this time. Mm -hmm.